Good morning, and welcome to Northminster Baptist Church. It's January 24th, 2021, and this is our online service. Join with me in taking a look at Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. In the English Standard Version, Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11, reads like this. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us together again today. Thank you that we can approach you through Jesus Christ, your Son. Thank you for your word, your law, your teaching, your precepts, for all that is contained in Scripture. Father, I pray that you will uh, guide us, that you will bless us together as we meet now to worship you and to study your word. In Christ's name, amen. Let's go to a time of musical worship. Please sing along as we're led by the Catanuses. sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. Thank you. 
ready to stay forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the It is great to worship together. Let's um, turn in our Bibles to 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 16. This is the passage for today. It's 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 16. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind that worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janas and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers opposed the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as is the case with those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Let's sing again.
give me wisdom You know just what to do Thank you, David, Naomi, and John. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you again that we can come before you. Father, you have richly blessed us, and we know that you have bestowed many gifts upon us. Uh, nonetheless, we live in some challenging times, and we have some prayers and petitions to bring before you. Father, we pray for those in our congregation who are uh, ill. We pray for those who are struggling with illness. We pray also for those who are struggling from injury or other medical conditions. Father, we pray for strength and for healing. We pray for your hand of blessing on them and for um, patience as they await your healing. Father, we pray for those in our congregation who are unemployed. We pray also for those who are underemployed. Father, we pray for those in our congregation who are exceptionally busy 
with um, things like teaching online or running a household with kids who are at home while simultaneously working from home. Father, we pray for those who go out and serve, uh, providing essential services uh, in the middle of this pandemic. Father, for all of these situations, we, we lift uh, the members of our congregation before you. Father, we pray for those who are uh, retired. We pray for those who are uh, at home and would normally be in contact with family and with friends. Father, we pray for uh, strength patience and wisdom for, for all of us. Father, we pray that you would give us uh, fortitude, that you would give us um, mental stamina to deal with uh, these days. And Father, we thank you for your presence through the Holy Spirit and for uh, just the, the certainty and hope of knowing you through this time. Heavenly Father, we, um, we pray as always for our leaders. We pray for the leaders of our country. We pray for the leaders of our province. We pray for the leaders of our city, that you would give them wisdom in balancing many different and challenging uh, demands right now. Father, we pray for the United States, our neighbor to the south, as they transition governments. Uh, Father, there has been a lot of unrest there, and we pray that you would, um, that you would guide, and I pray that people would yield their hearts to you. Father, there's been unrest in many other places around the world. There's uh, armed skirmishes uh, in the waters around China, there are some horrible uh, incidents taking place in uh, parts of Africa. There is political unrest in uh, Russia. Uh, there is uh, concern about police actions in Florida. Father, you are, you are sovereign and you are in control and nothing happens without your consent. Father, I pray that you would lead, that you would guide, that you would bless. And Father, I pray that we would turn to you, uh, that people across the world would turn to you in these times of challenge and crisis. Father, we thank you for your provision. Uh, we thank you for uh, your care. We thank you for your enduring love. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds as we uh, listen to uh, Pastor Camille bring a message that you have laid upon his heart about uh, Scripture and defense of Scripture, the battle for Scripture. Father, we pray all of these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. I call on uh, Pastor Camille to come and speak to us now. Thank you. Good morning. Let me begin with uh, a question this morning. Why should we still hang on to the orthodox, evangelical, historical view of the Bible as the final authority on matters of faith and morality when uh, the majority of intellectuals, scientists, theologians reject it as outdated and irrelevant in this day and age. This morning I will seek to address this issue and uh, at least partially because it's a very vast subject. The language of war is often used to describe the conflict that we as Christians encounter in a godless and hostile world. Uh, book titles reflect that reality. 
Let me just mention a few examples. The Truth War by John MacArthur. Cultural Shift, The Battle for the Moral Heart of America by Al Mohler. The Battle for the Bible by Harold Lizell. And then we have Born for Battle by Arthur Matthews. Another one is How to Meet the Enemy, Arming Ourselves for Spiritual Warfare by John MacArthur. And the list goes on. There are so many books where you find that title either War or Struggle or Fight. And that's the reality. And we can ask ourselves the question now, when did that war actually start? Scripture tells us that it all began long before the world, the universe, the world, and mankind were created. For example, the one passage that is referred to by theologians referring to Satan's fall is found in Isaiah chapter 14 and verses 12 to 15. Let me read these verses for, for us. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will set, sit and throne on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend, ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead and to the depths of the pit. When Satan rebelled against God, he declared war on the Almighty, the one who created him. And, uh, of course, Satan knew perfectly well that he could do nothing to touch God. He could not defeat God. And so he was left like this, and he just waited he waited until something happened. When Satan saw that God had created mankind in his image, Satan said to himself, Aha! That's my chance to get back at God. He was going to attack God's creation and particularly mankind made in the image of God. Mankind who was God's creation, who was uh, God, the pinnacle of God's creation, who was the apple of God's eye. And so Satan decided that he would get back at God by attacking mankind. And so he had a plan. It was a subtle plan. But it was a subtle and evil plan. It was very subtle because it did not come to man and say, Well, God was lying to you. God was doing this to you. God was holding you back. He simply used four words when he came to tempt Eve. And those four words are, Did God really say? Did God really say? And so that way Satan sowed the seed of doubt into the mind of Eve and her husband Adam. The seed was planted. From then on, it was all downhill all the way. The subtle seed of doubt has been Satan's main strategy over the centuries ever since he tempted Adam and Eve. This pernicious tool has been used by the enemy to destroy man's faith in God's integrity, in God's uh, truthfulness in what God said. The truthfulness 
of God's revelation and the trustworthiness of God's word as revealed in Scripture. God had clearly, very clearly warned his people to whom he had given his oracles. The people of Israel had received from God his word contained in the, uh, the, seven, the, the Ten Commandments, all in the five books of Moses, and then on and on through history as God revealed himself through various authors and through the prophets. And God said clearly to the nation of Israel through Moses, he said that they must never attempt to corrupt his word. They mustn't tamper with his word, to change anything in it. In order to do their own thing, listen to how simply and categorically God put it through his servant Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 4. Actually, sorry, it's Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. God said to them, Do not add to what I have commanded you. Do not subtract from it. But keep the commands of the Lord your God that I have given you. Notice how God says, You cannot add, you cannot subtract, but you are to keep everything that I have given to you. We can't modify God's word. We can just improve on it. What God has given us is authoritative and it is permanent and we must abide by what he has given to us. But Satan has always tried to deceive people, to delude people, and to use detractors to speak contrary to what God had clearly revealed in his word. We read, for example, in the prophet Jeremiah chapter 14 and verse 14. Then the Lord said to me, Jeremiah, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and delusions of their own minds. And this is what man has done from the time that Adam and Eve were tempted by Satan to doubt God's authoritative word. They've been changing. They have been presenting things that are from their own mind and which was evil and wicked. So there were many false prophets who pretended to speak in the name of God in the Old Testament. And when we move to the New Testament, we also meet those who were trying to pervert the truth of God. Probably the uh, earliest uh, book written in the New Testament is the letter to the Galatians. Already we hear from it and that the word of God had been attacked and that the precious truth of the gospel of grace was being corrupted. We read in Galatians chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7. Paul writing to them says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And that is exactly Satan's intention. It's a perversion of the truth. And uh, Satan continued his dirty work later. And uh, in the last letter that Paul wrote uh, from prison, before he was beheaded, we read in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 3 
and 4, we read this. From the, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a, gr a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears from away from the truth and turn aside to myths. All through the centuries that followed, Satan had le has led many to pervert the truth of God as revealed in his permanent word, and they have founded a pseudo-Christian groups that we know today we call cults, such as uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Christian scientists, and a host of others, and he has been deceiving millions of people. So attacks on the Bible um, have taken various forms. One was, as I have mentioned, is that they pervert the gospel. They bring, it a, they bring a different meaning to the truth of God, and therefore, as Paul says, it is no gospel at all. It is just error, and it throws people into darkness and away from God, and they do not know the truth and can be saved. And so that was one way. Another way that Satan was attacking the Word of God was to prohibit people from uh, having access to the Bible. For example, one very blatant one is that the Roman Catholic Church in the 4th and the 5th century prohibited the people uh, from reading the Bible. In the Middle Ages and later, even the translation of the Bible into other languages was strictly forbidden. For example, in uh, 1229, at the Council of Toulouse, the group that had met there, the ecclesiasticals, they met there and they decided, and I quote, we prohibit all that the laity should be, um, also that the laity should be permitted to have the books of the Old Testament and New Testament. But we must strictly forbid their having any translation of these books. So we see that both access to the Bible and translation of the Bible were forbidden. So this goes to show how much, how Satan did everything that he could to hide the truth that transforms lives, the lives of people, and he keeps them in darkness. Now many suffered horribly for taking the risk to try and get the Bible to, uh, to the people to give them access to the Word of God which contains the gospel that could save them. So many tried to translate the Bible into the English language and they got into trouble for it. For instance, a man by the name of John Wycliffe, very well known in the history of the Christian church, he lived in the 1300s, and he was declared a heretic. And then he died in 1384. Many years later, to show us how the church was determined to stop the spread of the gospel, in 1415, his Bones were exhumed and burnt, and his ashes were thrown into the river. That's to what length they would go to try and stop people from knowing the good news of Jesus Christ. Another example is William Tyndale, who also was declared a heretic. And then, in, in this case, what's even worse, the church in 1533 burned him at the stake. And that carried on. And it continued to, uh, we continued to experience this attack on the Word of God or trying to hide the Word of God from a people. 
because it contained light. It contains truth that could save people. In the 18th century, a man, a French philosopher, an intolerant and vicious enemy of the Bible and Christianity by the name of Voltaire, he boastfully predicted that within a hundred years, people would not be reading the Bible anymore. That's what he thought. That's the direction he thought things were going and that people would lose interest and that they would not be reading the Bible anymore. In an ironic turn of events, only 58 years after his death, the former home of Voltaire in Geneva, Switzerland, was serving as a storehouse for Bibles and gospel tracts. Isn't that interesting? Now, that story has been challenged by some people, but it has been verified by Dr. Daniel Merritt, who did extensive research to prove the authenticity of these claims. Another attack on uh, uh, the, the gospel of God, the truth of God, is, for example, by uh, the third president of the United States of America by the name of Thomas Jefferson. He was greatly influenced by the Age of Enlightenment and based, and based his thinking on uh, human reason rather than the revelation of God, human reason as the measure of all things. So they did not believe in the supernatural. He did not believe in miracles. And therefore what he did, history tells us that he picked up a pen knife and he went through the Bible and he cut out any reference to the miraculous and created his own version of the Bible. Imagine people like that, to what length they would go. I mean, you remove the miraculous from the Bible and you've got nothing left. Nothing. And so Satan continued to pervert the gospel and to prevent the spread of the truth of God, to keep people in darkness and from knowing the gospel of Jesus Christ and be liberated from the bondage of sin and Satan and false religions. And now moving on, we come to this, this time in history, in our own time. One last example I will give you. As recently as last year, the, the Chinese Communist Party had decided to rewrite the Bible. As one writer put it, Xi Jinping, the General Secretary of the, Christian, of the Chinese Communist Party, prefers a more subtle tactic than Mao's. A campaign to cynicize religion to make it more compatible with the teachings of the Chinese Communist Party. What another uh, author aptly called the gospel according to Xi. Anything in the Bible that does not conform to the communist ideology will be removed. And much more, of course, could be added. For example, liberal theology has done so much to undermine and uh, to discredit the claims of the Bible, the exclusive claims about Jesus Christ and the gospel that he brought to the world. On and on and it goes. In the meantime, as conservative evangelicals, you and I must continue to hold the Bible as the very words of God, inspired, infallible, and authoritative word of God in all matters, in matters of faith and conduct, in theology, in morality, and everything. This is our foundation. This is the truth of God. Without going into details for lack of time, I want you just to think again 
As many evangelical theologians have, have uh, showed us, the unity of the Bible from beginning to end, written by some 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years, the whole Bible is unified and has one theme. And then also you put together with that all the fulfilled prophecies. They all testify to the supernatural origin of the Bible and its authorship. The author is clearly and preeminently, supremely, God himself as it claims throughout the scriptures. There is so much more for us that we could say, but I will leave it here, and we can do another study another time about Scripture, but let me leave you with uh, this, these thoughts. Here are a few reasons. I will give you five reasons why Satan does not want people to know the truth to know the gospel, to have the Bible in their hands, to read about God. There are five main reasons, and there are more, of course, but I've selected all five for the time that we have here. So the reason number one is the Bible is our only comprehensive source of knowledge of the living God. Let me read from John chapter 5 for a moment. John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking. He says, he said to the Jewish leadership, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. And yet, you refuse to come to me to have life. Another scripture that we read is this. In Luke chapter 24, after the resurrection of Jesus, he met these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he was discussing with them what had happened. And then he says to them, And beginning with Moses... And all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Where do we have the knowledge of God? Where do we come to know Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the scriptures? This is the only source of knowledge of God. The Bible alone is the true and complete revelation of God. Left to our own imagination, you and I would quickly create a God in our own image. We need God's revelation to fully understand Him, His person, His attributes, His character, and what He has done and what He is doing today in our world. So that was number one. There's another reason why Satan does not want people to know the Bible and to have the Bible. And it's this. The Bible is the source of life. Let me read from Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verses 47, 46 and 47. And he said to them, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. Verse 47. They are not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. The word of God is life to us. That's what gives us the, the zest in life, the purpose in life, and real exuberance in life, and gives us motive in life. We need the Word of God, because in it is 
life. No wonder the Apostle Paul, when he was in prison and was awaiting his trial, and he asked that the scrolls and the parchments be brought to him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Because Paul knew the value of Scripture. It was his very life, and he wouldn't part from it. So the Bible indeed is our very life. Without it, we wither away spiritually and we die. Here's a third reason why Satan does not want people to have the Bible in their hands and to know the truth. It's because the Word of God liberates us from all error and bondage. The Lord Jesus Christ, again, discussing with the uh, religious leaders, he says this in John chapter 8 and verse 32. He says, Then uh, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The Word of God truly sets us free to live for God. And that is freedom from enslavement to innumerable things, uh, including especially Satan, false religions, uh, idols, love of money, sex, and what have you. The, the Word of God liberates us from all shackles. The fourth uh, reason why Satan does not want people to have uh, the Word of God in their possession, to be able to read it and get the good news from it, is that this is our vital source of energy and spiritual stamina. Jesus was tempted by Satan, as we all know, in the wilderness, and Satan tempted him to turn stone into bread because he hadn't eaten for such a long time, for 40 days and nights in the desert. And so Jesus responded to him in this way. It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is the, the infallible word of God that feeds us to the point where this becomes primary in our lives. And further in uh, Isaiah chapter 55, for example, and verse 3, God says, Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And it is this word of God that gives us life. It is the life-giving word of God that nourishes us as we have seen here. As much as water is the source of all life on earth, and so the Word of God is the source of all spiritual life for the believer. If we neglect the regular intake of the Word of God, then we will lack this nourishment and this spiritual uh, nourishment which is vital to life. So that's the fourth reason. There's uh, the fifth and last reason I will give you today, and by no means the last one uh, at all, because there are many other reasons. But there's the fifth reason. Satan does not want people to have the Bible in their possession and to read it and to know what God says and to benefit from it is because the Bible is our infallible guide and compass through this dark world. I will read from Psalm 25. First verses 5 and then verse 9. Guide me, is the prayer of the psalmist. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are my God and my Savior, and my hope is in you all the day long. And then down to verse 9, the psalmist says this, He guides the humble in what is right, what is right or what is true what God expects of us. And he teaches them his way. And this is most important. God teaches us his way through the scriptures, not by some 
extra biblical revelation, not by some voice that we might hear when we are in meditation or whatever. No, it is through the Bible. There is no other way. There's no other truth but God's truth and God's way. And that's why it is so essential for us to know the Word of God. Much more could be added to this, but these, I think, are sufficient to show us how critical and how vital the Word of God is for each one of us. And so we know that Satan will do everything he can to keep the Word of God from people, from people to know the truth. And then even when we become Christians, what does he do? He wants to prevent us from going to the Word. And so we get busy in life, or he begins to throw these doubts. Did God really say such and such? And so on and so forth. And that keeps us away from the Bible, which is our very life, our nourishment, our compass, our guide. And so I pray this morning that you will be encouraged to know that the Bible is the Word of God, the inspired, infallible Word of God. And if you do know it, that you will not neglect the consumption of the Word of God. It's a fabulous meal that God gives us day after day if only we would come and enjoy it because He has so much to give to us. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank You for Your Word. The word that was written so long ago, the word that has been preserved for us, the word that today we do have the privilege of possessing. And some of us have many Bibles. So we want to pray that we will not allow Satan to distract us or to prevent us from going to your word on a regular basis, day by day, to feed on it, to learn from it, to draw near to you through it, so that we may be people who truly know our God, who love our God, who are intimate with our God, who follow him, and most of all, to obey his word, because in this you are pleased. Help us, Father, not only to know it for ourselves, to enjoy it, to benefit from it, but also to do all we can to encourage others to go to your word or to point them to your word, to show them the truth so that they might come to the light, to Jesus Christ, and that they might experience his forgiveness and eternal life and live for you. Thank you once again for the great privilege we have in this great land of Canada. So far, to be free to possess your word and help us not to neglect it, but to enjoy it day by day, to benefit from it day by day, thereby to bring glory to your name. Amen.